time just Ben van Vieren, nice and short. I've got a wonderful Kozar friend, or Elvis Vunlani. He calls me uh, Ben von Fires. So, uh, but it's, uh, for me, I've, I've been called by God in 2009, so I've then left the secular world at that time, full time in ministry, trusting the Lord as I've continued. And my life has mainly been within the training perspective. And uh, where I currently function is with Veritas for the last four years. Um, training pastors and also a couple of participants during the week. So that's the space I function in, uh, my context currently. It's a privilege to preach once in a while and to share the word of the Lord. But there's a lot of work out there when we look upon the world that is still lost. So as we sang the song that Christ must be proclaimed so people can come to him. But the second part of it is that the church must be strengthened to be who it should be, who she should be, to be the bride of Christ, to be a radiance of the groom that will be coming one day, and to prepare people for that. I think that's the heart of it. And for me, what's burning in my heart and where it drives me is to help Christians just to become passionate about Christ again, passionate about God's word again, and to start proclaiming that and go and make disciples as the Lord Jesus hath commanded us. So this morning was lying on my heart and the gospel that's very near to me. When I find myself, I'm back in it. So I want to just share something from Mark, the gospel of Mark. It's our first gospel. So we're going to be in chapter one and uh, we're going to read a few verses there and then I will preach on it as well. So once you've opened your Bibles on Mark chapter 1, let's just close our eyes, let's quiet down our hearts, and let's just bow before the Lord. Lord Jesus, when we bow before you this morning, we want to acknowledge you as our Lord and our God, as the Gospels and your word says to us, Lord, that you are sitting on the right hand of the Father. Matthew says that all authority is given unto you that is on earth as well as in heaven. And therefore, we come to you this morning and we want to ask as we gather together that you have sent us the Holy Spirit. You've said that the Holy Spirit will come and will lead us. He will guide us. He will teach us. And he will mainly teach us the whole truth. He will come and proclaim Christ to us. And Lord Jesus, when we, when we bow this morning before you and we read this first gospel that is captured within Scripture, we want to ask that the Holy Spirit this morning will reveal yourself to us as individuals. As we are gathered as a congregation this morning, Lord, we can also say as individuals, we need you. And therefore, as Paul says, portray yourself as Jesus the crucified. Portray yourself this morning that we will see you through scripture. Give us a burning desire as the Emos guys have walked with you. That said that hearts have been warmed. Burning desire because they've met you. Give us that moment this morning. And therefore, bless me, Lord, hide me behind the cross. As I share your word, give me the freedom and the boldness to share it, and proclaim it. But give us this morning also ears to hear, a heart to understand, and acceptable to your word. And therefore, we say, Lord, that we cannot do it without you. It's your word, it's your gospel, it's your kingdom, it's your proclamation. And it's only you that can convict and help us. Therefore, we pray for your grace. Thank you, Lord, that we can ask this as we pray this in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, let me read for you from, this is the NET translation. It's been done recently. It's a very literal one, and I quite like it. It might be a little bit different from you. We're going to read the first 18 verses there. So Mark says this. He says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his, make his path straight. 
In the wilderness, John the baptizer be, uh, began preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People from the whole Judean countryside and all of Jerusalem were, come, were going out to him. And he was baptizing them in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. John wore a garment made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locust and wild honey. He proclaimed, One more powerful than I am is coming after me. I am not worthy to bend down and untie the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw the heaven splitting apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my one dear Son, in you I take great delight. The Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness he was in the wilderness 40 days, enduring temptations from Satan. He was with wild animals and angels who were ministering to his needs. Now, after John was in prison, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of God and said, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. As he went along the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will turn you into fishers of people. They left their nets immediately and followed him. Now let me just give you some background here. So Mark is an interesting fellow, and there's obviously some different views about it. So many scholars believe that Mark is the same Mark, John, which we find in, in Acts, which had that conflict with the Apostle Paul, and then left and spent some of his time in his journey with Barnabas. But we then find that this Mark then later is reconciled to Paul, and he then also journeys with Paul. So many believe this Mark that wrote the gospel is the same person. But what we also find within the tradition of Christianity is that Mark spent a lot of time with Apostle Peter. So he's mainly a disciple of Peter, but also then of Barnabas and Paul, if that all fits within your narrative there. But you can now think for the early church now. Jesus has been crucified. He has ascended. And now these first three decades after that time, because the Gospels, we've got the first ones late in the 50s, about 20 years after Christ. That's more or less the first time we had them. So up until this point, there's no Gospel that's been written. Most of what's happening is by oral. It's the proclamation of the apostles because they're still living. They're going around and preaching. And Paul is also functioning in a specific time. So you can now think for yourself. Just think back for a moment. You don't have scripture. You don't have the Old Testament. You had this event play off of this person which they've called Jesus. They said he's the Messiah, the promised one from God. And he has been crucified. And there's the stories going around that he has resurrected. And now you find this movement that have started where people is proclaiming that he is God. And you have this work of the apostles and the miracles that's happening there. You have Pentecost that happened. So there's a buzz in the world at the moment. And you find this continuation of followers that's been added to the church. Now you find this guy, Mark, that is not part of the group initially because he was not a disciple. He's now following with the apostles. He's spending most of his time there. He had this conflict with Paul. And he decided he's going with Barnabas. But now you can also think he's learning a lot of things. And then later he consults with Paul. We don't have much what he's done with Paul. But what we have in the traditions regarding Peter. Now Peter being one of the three closest disciples of Jesus, with Jesus, like John and like James, you can imagine how many stories he could have told Mark. You know what's wonderful for me? I'm traveling with Harman many times with training. So what happens? You've got a day of training, and tonight we're sitting at the place where we're staying, and we are maybe having a meal, and we talk about the day. We talk about a lot of other things. And I'm imagining these times where Mark probably sat down with Peter, maybe at lunch or dinner or in the living room, if you want to say, or maybe on the, walk as they've, uh, on the road as they've walked. And having all these conversations and saying, what did Jesus say about this? What did Jesus taught about that? 
And he has all this wealth of information coming to him. What a privilege, isn't it? So what we find in the early tradition, why I'm leading to this is, as Mark and the disciples and the apostles moved around, you can imagine when we have a famous person in our midst, we usually just look up to them. We don't hit them and, and start having conversations, is it? We talk to their servants, the people around them say, how's this guy like? How's this lady like? And I think this was more or less the same. So we find in the tradition, especially in the first century, that our church fathers actually said that the church actually asked Mark and say, listen, you're spending so much time with the apostles. You're not willing to actually write this down for us so we can share within this. So we can have part of what's, what's been said. And that actually, I believe, is also what led to the writing of the Gospel of Mark. So Mark is our first Gospel. Most of scholarship will agree today, Mark is the first Gospel. Not Matthew or John, Mark. And it was this time which he have spent, this apostle or this disciple of Peter. So it's actually Peter's narrative, isn't it? But Mark is not one that's spending time chronological to say, let me pack it clearly for you chronologically to make sense of the ministry of Jesus. He's got a very specific reason for his narrative and the way he unpacks his gospel. It's a short gospel, but it's a busy gospel. It's a very fast gospel because you have fast movements in there. You have all these key words, verbs that's there immediately and, and strong emphasis on several things. He also spends a lot of time in the last section in the ministry of the Lord Jesus, especially on the crucifixion and so forth. Mark, you can also see here, yeah, he's not spending time with the childhood of Jesus and leading to a lot of things. He's just getting into it. And that's why an old view of Mark is that Mark actually just wrote to the, to the Roman world because they were just interested, what can you do? Matthew writes about where you're coming from because that's a Jewish perspective. But I think there's a little bit of change in the view there. So this just gives you a setup from where it is. Mark later on then also established the church within Alexandria, which is in Africa. And this is quite fascinating. Thomas Oden has done a lot of work here to establish Christianity back on the African continent. Because the old view is that Christianity were originated in the West, originated within Europe. But what you actually find here, Mark already, a pastor in Alexandria, the gospel has been preached within the African soil which is quite fascinating, which I like. But he is later also then being killed as a martyr within that specific context. So that just gives us on Mark itself. So let me just give you the context of the time period here. Remember now, if we're about two decades, three decades after Christ, we're still sitting within the Roman Empire. This is before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So you still have a very much of a Roman Empire that's been done there. What you also then find is, just before the Gospels, we have this 400 years of, that, of silence. Now, I'm not sure if you know about it, but between Malaga and the Gospels that's been written, there's 400 years which we don't have much writing about it. But that doesn't mean nothing happened. Because what do we find, especially in Luke, when um, Zachariah was proclaimed about the coming of John the Baptist, and what about Anna that was there, and especially the practices within the temple. You still find that it continued. It wasn't silent. It wasn't a time of where people were just Gentiles and not being concerned about the things of God. There was still a lot of activity there. We find the Qumran communities. We find people being back within Jerusalem, being back in context. So you do find a strong emphasis of people that were turning back to the things of God. Because people understood that, especially from the Old Testament. If we obey the commandments of the Lord, the Lord will visit us again. But there's no profit at this time. So people started doing things. We do find several holiness movements that got started in that time, moving people back to the Lord. We find a lot of temple activities that has been there. The Pharisees have been practicing, and especially, like I said, the, Qum the Qumran communities there. Now, John fits within this perspective, and we will um, speak about it a little bit later. So he's calling and he's coming, is especially what the Old Testament says. Is this preparation phase for the Lord. So you can see there's an expectation from people. Sometime something needs to happen. Because the whole Old Testament is a prophecy of the coming of a Messiah. 
They will be the son of God that will come. They will be the one which God will send. But they don't know when in a specific time. We find this new religious movement that has been established. Now on the Roman side, it's quite different. Because you have a polytheistic structure. So what it means is that people, the majority of that world, acknowledged but also worship many gods. That's what they've done. It's not just worshiping and acknowledging them in your home, in the corner, but they've also had several temples erected for them. They've honored them on their buildings. They've had many rituals. They had many festivals in the specific time. It's also a time period from the Greeks to the Romans. We have a lot of mythology that has happened. And this will probably be familiar for you. So there was three main gods, and I need to mention them. It was Jupiter, it was Juno, and it was Minerva. So Jupiter was the heavenly god as they saw him. But he was the overseer of all humanity and, life's, and the aspects of life. So you have this god which they had in these myths to say they oversee everything. And what they believed is he was born out of Zeus, which was the god of the Greeks, basically. And he also focused on the protection of the Roman people. So now you can see with this empire being there and any threats that has been coming, they would have run to Jupiter to say, you are our protector. You need to protect us from these people. And therefore, they've also built him a temple. Juno was his wife, but also his sister. And what they actually saw is that Juno was the overseer of women and all aspects of women's lives. And Minerva was the god of wisdom and competency, but he was also the overseer of children. So what you actually have is you have a cultural establishment that you have three gods that's overseeing all aspects of humanity. Men, women, children, competency, and wisdom. There's no context of God here. So this, in a way, reminds you of the time period when the Israelites were slaves within Egypt. It was very hostile again. It was the same within Egypt, which you find here. And there's several other gods, which I don't want to mention here. What the people have done then, obviously, they've, done, they've built them temples. They've done, done a lot of rituals as well as festivals for them. Now, all prosperity and suffering were directly related to the moods of the God. All right, fascinating, isn't it? So if things is going bad, people immediately said, the gods are mad. They're not feeling happy at this moment. If there's prosperity, the gods are happy. And therefore you would have found that they had this continuous offering for the gods to appease them. All right. This is a Roman context. Can we relate to it? Yes, very much. Can you see this morning? Humanity haven't changed. It's just wearing new faces, new names. Still the same. Still the same prom problems. This Roman Empire is having the same issues which the people had in Egypt. Same issues. Now we're sitting 2,000 years later, we're still having the same problems. People still link their prosperity and their suffering to gods. They still want to offer and appease them. We're still sitting in the same context. Nothing has changed. Now Mark is speaking within this context. And he's writing now the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So can you for a moment just reflect and say, if a Roman person have heard, son of God, what's jumping out of their minds? If a Hebrew person that's expecting a Messiah, hearing, hey, this person is the son of God, is he the promised one? You've got a different context. And Mark's addressing and navigating both these spaces within his gospel. And that's why he's so strong in the beginning. He says, in the beginning, what does he say? Of the good news. It's this proclamation about Jesus, the NIV says, the Messiah. 
He's very clear what is he saying. Jesus. What does Matthew say to us Jesus means? It's he will, that will deliver his people from their sins. He says the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one that will come. It's him. He says the good news about him. And then he calls him this, the son of God. This is fascinating. We're going to spend all morning just in this word. But you can see there's a lot of things that's jumping out within this perspective here. So what Mark is doing, Mark's main theme, if you're going to go and read the whole gospel of 16 chapters, his main focus is to identify Jesus Christ as the Son of God. It's about identity. If you read through it, you will find many characters within the gospel. But the one main character within the gospel is only Jesus Christ. He's the only character that is fully formed within Mark's narrative. Jesus is clearly identified within it. Go and spend some time. You will see there's a lot of witnesses. The first witness that Jesus is the son of God is from an unclean spirit within the synagogue. Just later in chapter 1. So just stop and think for a moment. The first witness that goes out to the world and to the reader of the gospel that Jesus is the Son of God is not through the priest. It's not the church. It's not the high priest. It's not Jesus himself. It's the unclean spirit that testifies where? In a synagogue. That's the church of the time. Something to think about. And you find several ones throughout the gospel and Jesus quieting down. The first time a person testifies, apart from Jesus telling them what the Messiah will look like and what he will need to go through, is at the end in chapter 15 when a Roman soldier saw Jesus die on the cross, then he said, surely this man is the son of God. So Mark is occupied with the identity of Jesus. And therefore you can find three main themes within the gospel. One is Jesus and his identity. Now see the flow here. He introduces Jesus and he identifies who he is. Secondly, he says this person needs to have disciples. So his second theme is discipleship and their identity. And then he leads to discipleship, goes of holiness. Walking with the one that is holy. So you have this flow. Jesus having disciples that's walking with him, identified with him, and their life needs to be a life of holiness. That's a full perspective of the gospel, if you think about it. Now, how is Mark doing this narrative? And this is quite wonderful. If you study about the Old Testament, you will find the rich language that Mark underlays within his gospel here. Have you picked that up? Because what is he doing? He says, in the beginning, Jesus Christ, the good news, this proclamation, is the Son of God. And then he brings in Isaiah. And he says, Isaiah says these words. What did Isaiah say? He says, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the paths for him. So Mark now brings in the whole Old Testament. He brings in this prominent prophet, Isaiah, and he says there was a proclamation of one that will come that will prepare the way of the Lord. It's fascinating. Mark is not just quoting a verse. He's quoting two from Isaiah as well as Malachi. So he's got this concept of an understanding of the Old Testament that he's doing here. This underlying story here. And what I believe here and some scholars is that he's underlying the story of Israel. Because I think Mark is sitting down and saying, listen, if I'm going to write up this story about Jesus, who's my audience and how will they understand it? I think he realized the same. 
The best for them to understand it is to unpack it through the Old Testament story. What God has been doing, let me show them how Jesus has done it. And this is not new for us. We know Jesus of fulfillment. We just sang it. Our pastor just prayed it as well. So he's using this Old Testament story and under, overlying it as well with Jesus himself. So Mark is convinced that the story of God will make the most sense to place the story of Jesus on top of it as it has been done within the Old Testament. As Jesus is, as, as Jesus is overlaid, Mark challenges the reader, the reader to a different reading and the mindset of what they think and actually requires his reader to follow the text and allow Jesus to teach and shape them. There's a lot of things that's happening here. So Jesus is the son of God. He's opposing the current context and the character and the reader. So what you will find here is that the context and the things which the people were bringing to, to the narrative, if you think about the community of Qumran and the Israelites that were waiting for a Messiah, and you also find on the Roman side, you do find that Mark is challenging the reader as well as the characters within this context. It sets a scene of the wilderness, this time period of captivity within Egypt, as well as this leading out within the wilderness, as well as that's beyond. You do find that very strong. And especially I do think there's a reason why John has been baptizing them in the Jordan, because that's the place where Joshua led these people back into the promised land. So there's very significance that's here. But it also leads in a period of good news. That's specifically here. So this is the beginning of the narrative. And I've said to you, it's these names of Jesus and the Christ, the Messiah, is quite fascinating and quite strong here. So listen to Isaiah's two quotes here. Isaiah 35 says these words. A thoroughfare will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it. It is, it is reserved for those authorized to use it. Fools will not stray on, into it. No lions will be there. No ferocious wild animals will be on it. They will not be there. Those delivered from bondage will travel on it. Those whom the Lord has ransomed will return that way. They will enter Zion with a happy shout. Unending joy will crown them. Happiness and joy will overwhelm them. Grief and suffering will disappear. What a prophecy. So you can see the people in Qumran and that community being there. If they've read desire, they say, there's a time where things are going to split up here. There's going to be a way of holiness, a different path here. But those that are fools and don't want to follow the ways of the Lord, it's not going to be on this path. Oh Lord, when is the season coming? We are awaiting this as Isaiah spoke it. Then chapter 40. He says, Comfort my people, says the Lord. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and tell her that her time of warfare is over. Tell her punishment is completed. For the Lord has made her pay double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness clear a way for the Lord. Build a level road through the rift valley of our God. Every valley must be elevated, and every mountain and hill leveled. The rough terrain will become a level plain. The rugged landscape, a wild valley. The splendor of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it at the same time, for the Lord has decreed it. So you can see here's where um, Mark is leaning on this prophecy and this proclamation of Isaiah. It's this preparation and this every aspect that needs to be leveled out for the preparation of the Lord. The Malachi uses these words in chapter 2. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, How have we wearied him? Because you say, he answers, Everyone who does evil is good in the Lord's opinion, and he delights in them, they said. Or, they said, where is the God of justice? And then the Lord answers, I'm about to send my messenger, who will clear the way before me. Indeed, the Lord 
Uh, indeed, the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come in his temple, and the messenger of the covenant whom you long for is certainly coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So you can see this last book we have, you have this strong proclamation of a messenger that will come, that will prepare this way for the Lord, because he's having this conversation with them and saying, but you are arguing this and therefore I have had these problems with you guys. And this is fascinating. People were asking, where's the God of justice? Where's the God of justice? And he says, but I will send the messenger for you. So you have the proclamation of the coming of the Messiah. And the reader would say, yes, you have it. We are expecting him. He is the one we are waiting for. I don't think there would have been conflict there. A specific community was expecting a Messiah. They were waiting for God to come and deliver them. Especially under the Roman oppression at this specific time. Now Jerome wrote this within the 4th century. And he said these words. As long as you are in your home. Make your cell your paradise. Gather there the varied fruits of scripture. Let them be your favorite companions. And take his precepts to your heart. So what he's saying is that as you study scripture. Do it in your home, but be joyous about it. Prepare it in your heart so there's fruit of Scripture here. So what you find here is this is a preparation season. You have this Old Testament period that's coming to an end here. And we'll one day maybe speak about the dispensations. But what you have here is you have an ending of a period here. Because as John the Baptist is coming now, this, this first Old Testament season is coming to a change now. Because it's inaugurating the coming of the Son of God. The season that's coming here. But you have John the Baptist in the middle here. And that's what Jerome is leading on here. He's to say, is, if you don't have this preparation, how will you see the Messiah? And this is what's fascinating for me. is I can't believe the Pharisees missed the Messiah so much. Continuously in conflict with the Lord Jesus through his ministry. Not seeing who he is. But they had the Old Testament here. And this leads us into the second part here. John the Baptist. Now Jerome continues and he said these words. John the Baptist had a religious mother. Because remember now his father was a priest. Alright, don't forget that. Yet neither his mother's affections. Nor his father's affluence. Could induce him to live in his parents house at the risk of. Of the world's temptation. So what Jerome is saying here in the 4th century is that. Apart from the house that John was coming from. Not his mother's affection or even his father's house or office where he's been. Could keep him in the house of his parents. Because as we've read. Wh where was John? He was in the desert. He's not in his home. And he says that he could live in his house for the risk of this world's temptation. That's his opinion. So he says, so John, he lived in the desert. And then he says these wonderful words. Seeking Christ with his eyes, he refused to look at anything else. His rough garb, his girdle made of skins, his diet of locusts and wild honey were alike designed to encourage virtue and continuance. So think about it. It's coming from a wonderful house. He should be a priest because he's in the line of the priesthood. But we find John within the desert and he's got one longing. Oh, he's seeking the face of Christ. We don't have context in the Gospels that John knew when Jesus will come. We don't. His proclamation even here is quite different. He's just saying somebody will come after me. He's not saying he's coming today or tomorrow. So you find John got this longing and a desire to see the coming of Jesus. Coming of Christ the Messiah. So John the Baptist, fascinating guy, a lot to say about him. But what we do find is he's very much set in Mark's narrative, the same as a resemblance of Elijah. So people would have resembled him as a prophet, mainly or how he's been dressed. Secondly, because he survived in the desert. 
The understanding of the time was, especially coming from the Old Testament, there's no way you can, you can stay alive and survive the desert if God's not providing for you. Because remember Elijah, where God fed him at the um, broom bush through the angels and the crows, kept him, many other aspects. God caring for his people in the wilderness for 40 years. That's the context. That's the underlying which Mark is lying on here. So John coming forth from the desert, looking like a prophet, proclaiming like a prophet, people will immediately realize there's no way you can be alive if God is not caring for you. God's not providing for you. That's the context that he sets up here. And living from locust and honey. That's sufficient food for him. Not within his father's house and having all these wonderful meals there. Now Adam Clark, he, he he's, describes the priestly office in this way when people would have realized John being actually from the priestly line. He said there's four aspects regarding clothes that would have reminded people what it means. Firstly, it's this purity, this necessity of purity in all aspects in worshiping God. Because when people got to the temple and the priests have done them service and even the sacrifices through the time, it was related to purity. The second thing was atonement for sins. So Old Testament context. Thirdly, the purity and the righteousness of God's majesty. Who God is and how he should be worshipped. And the necessity of holiness. Without no one will see the Lord as we find later within Hebrews. There's no walking with sin and a wicked life and saying, I'm serving God. You do find these two apart from each other. And we find this conflict between the communities as well as within the Roman Empire. So then within the season, John then comes and he proclaims a message. Did you hear that message? He says, I am proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now this is quite fascinating. Because you find here that John is very specific in what he's proclaiming. You don't find context here of forgiveness. What he's saying is, I'm on the forefront and what I'm proclaiming to the people is, you must be baptized. You can't be baptized if it's not a confession of sins. The confession of sins is the baptism, is the confirmation of that. But there's no context like a priest or a high priest to say, because you've done this, your sins are forgiven. There's no text in that. It's this preparation phase. Then your question is, so he's coming from the desert. Does he have an audience? I'm thinking through this and saying, this, this guy is coming from the desert. How can he have an audience? And if he started proclaiming, will people then listen and come to him? And what do we find within the narrative? Yes, people came, came from Jerusalem. He says, even from the whole Judean area, people came to him. A great amount came to him. And not just to come and say, ah, let's just listen to this guy because we want to be fascinated through him and just be entertained. We do find that they've responded because he said that he has baptized them as people have confessed their sins. There's confessions that's happening here. It's public confessions. And therefore, John has baptized them. But then his second part in his sermon is actually the important one. He says, so you see me as important. Because you all came out here to listen to me. And you're not just listening to me, you're also obeying me. You're also doing what I'm saying. You're responding to that. You're confessing your sins. But let me tell you, there's one coming after me that I am not even worthy to stoop down and untie the, sand, the, the straps on his sandals. Now think about it. I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. If I can lean into the Gospels a little bit here. Later on, they asked the Lord Jesus, so when is Elijah coming? 
and have this conversation about the prophets and the greatness about them. And then Jesus said these words, There is no one so important and so great than John the Baptist. So Jesus comes and he makes John the Baptist the greatest prophet there ever was. No one above him. No one greater. He's the one that's leading in the season of Christ. Not even Elijah or Moses is greater than John the Baptist. And he is saying, I am not worthy. You see, here's why I'm struggling with Christianity today. I think somewhere we miss things. You know, there's a statement which says, we many times stumble in where angels fear and tremble. Have you heard that before? We stumble into places where angels fear and tremble. John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to bow down before Christ and tie his shoes. But we're in a season where people jump up and down and we make mockery of the church and of Christ. We've brought him down, as Paul says in Romans 1. Make him our equal. And Paul even goes further to say they make him a four-level creatures, like insects. Bring Christ down to our level so he can be our friend. He can be among us. It's a great concern for me of the church today. How familiarized we have become with Jesus. How we made him a normal human. How we act before him. How we manage services. How we gather together. What we say. What we argue for. It's sad. If you stop and think it, then we say, Lord, I'm not worthy of anything. But we find people climbing the ladder more of familiarity. And celebrities. And I must be known because I'm a man of God. I once rebuked a pastor in the service. And afterwards when I spoke to him, the first thing he said to me is, How do you dare touch the man of God? See, that's our problem. It's our problem in education these days. Get all these titles to say, please call me Reverend Doctor. You see, you're missing the point here. The longer Paul has been an apostle, the more he called himself a slave. And the slave in a biblical time context was to say, Don't know me, know my master. It doesn't matter if you know my name, know Jesus. Know the Son of God. Don't know Ben. Forget about me. Know Christ. Walk with Him. And this is what John is saying. Think about this. This guy has been called by God to prepare a way. Friends, this is a massive time period. It's not something light and just say, ah, it's just John who baptized people. No. 400 years, five decades, no prophet. People's longing. And this guy's coming and saying, you are all here. Wow, what a wonderful audience and you're responding to me. But let me tell you, stop following me. Follow the one that's coming after me. Because he... He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John declares himself bankrupt. The moment Jesus arrives on the scene, he's got no ministry left. It's done. What do you think was Simon's uh, ministry? Just carrying the cross of Jesus. Just for a few miles to get him crucified. It was his ministry purpose. Life's purpose many times, I think. But a person that have stayed a disciple of John the Baptist after Jesus has came to the forefront, got a problem. 
Because John is not the Messiah. John is not the Christ. And what I want to say by that as well is there's many people stuck at just confessing their sins. They are not following Jesus. There are many people still stuck in the Old Testament. They're just obeying the laws. Lord, I should not steal. Lord, I should not lie. Just want to live a good moral life. There's many atheists that live good moral lives. Have they moved to the stage to say confession of sins? Because it's scriptural. It's this movement of time which you find here. But it moves on to Christ. Because Mark then says, and this is the first time he mentioned in the verse 1, he says, this is what my narrative is about. But Jesus has not been introduced yet. You only have John here. Wonderful character. He would have been a wonderful pastor. But if we stayed with him, we've got a problem. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. And Mark's also not spending much time here. And he baptized Jesus. And have you read these words? All the translations is there, but we must interpret it. When Jesus came out of the water, right? He saw. You read that? So the question is, did the audience that's around that place now, that's with John the Baptist, have they seen the dove descended like on the head of Jesus? The spirit as a dove descended. Is that what the gospel is saying? The gospel of Mark is saying, only Jesus saw it. And this is what I, I like, but this is difficult spaces to move in because the reader now got information, the characters that they don't have. The reader saying, ah, there's a spirit that came upon Jesus. The characters didn't know it because we also don't find the chains in the, the act there. And then the voice coming and saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. No why they liked it is the NET says. So this dove, the spirit that has descended, as well as the voice that have been spoken, was only for Jesus. That's what Mark is saying. Because I told you, Mark's, Mark is focusing on the identity of Jesus. That's where his emphasis is lying. As Jesus have went under and is coming up, you have this blessing from God upon him. And therefore, he's the son of God. You have this heavenly act that's play, taking place here, this inauguration of his ministry. You have this voice that's speaking to him and say, you are my beloved son, and I am well pleased with you. There's a heresy that's within Christianity for many years many centuries, but he's still alive today, that some people will say Jesus has been a good candidate. And this is where Jesus as a normal man has been elected and God anointed him with the Spirit. He became Christ, and now he has to fulfill the ministry of the Son of God. That's heresy. That's not, that's not right. That's not what you should believe. Jesus is fully Son, fully man, fully God. He is God. This is not a point for where Jesus has just been a normal person and now God just anointed him. It's not that. Because you remove completely the incarnation. It's heresy. And it has followed us for many years. And why I'm saying that, I have stumbled upon it with pastors the other day again. But what we find here is this. Because in this narrative, if you think about the Roman Empire and what's happening there, and you think about the people within the Qumran community, this is gold for them. This is wonderful news for them. Because a Roman person will understand it needs to be something from the gods here for us to acknowledge that this is an important person. For the Jewish people, they want to see God the Father's hand in here because they don't got any context of the Son or the Holy Spirit. That's the language they will understand. 
The voice, God spoke to them many times in history. So as the father comes and says, this is my son now, and I am delighted with him, the people would have said, okay, we can see this is maybe God working. It's not just words, friends. It's important. It's important here. So the question is, what about John then? What was his purpose? It's this leading in. He was not the Messiah. And many probably thought he was, and that's why I'm mentioning this. Could he forgive sins? There's no context in any of the Gospels that he did. So what you find is you actually find Mark in the Bible helping us with how does salvation look like. It's this preparation phase. It's this leading up to. And now when Jesus is introduced, and he's coming out of the water, Mark says, the Spirit took him away to the wilderness. Again, Old Testament language here. And Mark's not spending so much time as look on it. But what we have here is that in this wilderness, Jesus has been victorious over the temptations of Satan. He mentions it. He has been among wild animals. Can you see Isaiah here? And even the angels came and ministered to him. That's fascinating. So again, you have this wilderness underlying here. You have Jesus now doing which the people couldn't do for 40 years. Withstand temptation. What do we find continuously within those 40 years in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Numbers? You find the people mourning, complaining. Lord, we want that. Lord, we're longing back. Couldn't withstand temptation. But here you find Jesus, firstly, being victorious over the temptations of Satan. We have him among wild animals. No harm to him. So what does it say? He's victorious over Satan, which is the ruler of the world. He is God because he's ruling over creation. You see the wild animals there? And angels minister to him. He's above angels. And Mark encapsulates all this because he's got this context that he needs to deal with. For the Jewish people, it says, yes, this is the Messiah. For the Roman people, it says, hey, I need some mind change here. That's something I need to rethink here. And as this narrative then leads in, it gets to a place to say, John has been in prison. John is out of the sea now. Jesus steps forward and his ministry begins. And what is he proclaiming? The time is fulfilled. What does that mean? This time of waiting, this Old Testament of prophesying and promises that's here for how the Messiah looks like, this time is fulfilled. It's here now. And that's after John has been imprisoned. It's God's timing now. But now if we say confession of sins is enough, then it would have been in the gospel. But Jesus comes and he says these words. Repent. And believe the gospel. Now this repent is quite fascinating here. And I'm almost done. But it's not just like we know repentance of walking and then stopping and the turning away from. This metanoia is also very strong regarding understanding. Because if you read this gospel, Mark is strong in understanding. It's a continuous conversation of Jesus and his disciples. Why don't you understand? How is it that you don't see? How is it that you don't hear? Very strong. So when he calls him to repentance here, He's also calling them to a mindset that needs to change here. And that's many times our challenge as well. So this word can be translated in a few meanings. So let me read it to you. It says, it's a change of place or condition. So you can't just say, like, if you see the narrative here, 
The people in the Qumran community can't just continue walking and say, we're obeying the law. But now we have repented. But we continue in that line. Mark says no. It also can't just be to say, listen, I've just confessed my sins and that's fine. There needs to be a change of mindset that needs to happen here. A change of condition. It is to exercise the mind. It is to comprehend. It's to consider. It is to think. It is to understand. But then it also says, it's to think differently. It is to reconsider. And then it makes also this, from the noun here, it uses the word to say, it's to see with the eyes or to perceive or to observe. And this is a strong language and we'll probably get to that one day. But what you find here is just, it's a completely different thinking that needs to happen here as well. It is not just repenting. Because Jesus calls them to believe the gospel. Something needs to happen from here. It can't be just a continuation of the old life. There's a new life that needs to happen here. So the question then comes to the reader. Will anybody follow him? <laughs> the reader's got this wonderful voice from heaven. And this journey he undertook in the wilderness, and he's been victorious. And now he comes to the front, and he's alone. And he says, the time of God is fulfilled. Repent and believe the good news. Believe the gospel. Will anybody follow him? And where does Jesus go? He goes to the Sea of Galilee. And as he walks on the shore, he sees two brothers. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishermen of men. And what does the text say to us? They left their nets, and they followed him immediately. Was it the next day? Was it the next week? Was he going home and say, we need to ponder about it? We need to finish off our business? No. They left their nets and they followed him immediately. You see, we bring all this New Testament context to the text. And say, so because we have all this, it's easy to follow Jesus. Think about it. Here comes a strange man and say, leave everything. Come, I will go and make you fishermen of men. And they leave their stuff and they follow him. Two followers. Just further down the line. Another two. There's more for them because they're not just leaving their nets. They're also leaving their family. And they followed him immediately. So Jesus got four disciples who followed him immediately. So what I'm getting at this morning, one, I hope you get excited about reading your Bible again. My first thing, Scripture is so fascinating. There's so much detail there, so much things to ponder about. There's no bottom for Scripture if we spend time in it. And I hope you have been enticed this morning to say, I've gotten excited to read Mark again, and hopefully the rest of the Bible again. But friends, I also want to ask you this morning, where are you in this journey? And there's another dispensation, there's a time where we live in within the Holy Spirit. But people also find them within these spaces. You do have a Gentile that's not concerned in any way about the things of God. You have in our context a Jew, a person that's following the law. That's Paul's language in Romans 3. We obey the law. We say we should not steal, we should not lie, we should not do that. But that still doesn't make us a Christian. Paul uses it in Galatians to say the law is a school teacher for us to come to Christ. So some people live in that space in that time. It's this preparation phase. Some has only moved up to the point to say, we in the time of John the Baptist. We've just confessed our sins. But there's no change in life. But then you have this time period of walking with Jesus. And that's the rest of the gospel. Walking with the one that is holy. That's a Christian. The scripture is full of that. Repented, believe the gospel, and walking with Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit is being led by him, 
become a mature Christian. Where are we this morning? Because you're somewhere in these five. But what I want to say is, you can only get to heaven as we eternity spend time with God if you wear these last phases. My concern is, as I'm spending time with a lot of people in a year, many Christians hardly read their Bibles. The reason why Veritas does so many trainings, we've trained 35,000 people last year, is because Christians struggle to read their Bibles. And many don't even read them. So if they're not spending time with the God of this Bible, Whose word this is. I'm concerned about the relationship. And because we've brought grace down to make it so cheap for us. You've got a lot of people that said, I have accepted Jesus. I have prayed a prayer. But there's no change in life. There's no walking with Jesus. And for many, it's maybe like John. They just realize the price is too high. We can't. We're not going to follow. So where are you this morning? And I want to encourage you, don't stay there. Move on. Wherever you are, come to Jesus. I can do nothing for you. I'm just a follower on this road. It's only Jesus. John the Baptist ministry ended. He's got no salvation. I've got no salvation. Only in Christ. And can you honestly testify this morning and say, I am following him. My life is a testimony to that. Amen. Let me pray for us. And then somebody can come for conclusion. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for who you are. Thank you that we can just bow before you and say, Lord, thank you for your wonderful grace that's continuously busy working and that you have also, you've spoken to me this morning, Lord, and I trust you that you have also done so with each one. And therefore, I want to pray for them this morning, Lord. They know exactly where they are with you. Because you say to us that the Holy Spirit will come and he will convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And therefore, this morning, we know exactly where we stand with you. And therefore, I pray, Lord, I pray for them that they will make earnest with you, that they will come to you, they will seek your face, and they will humble themselves before you. That they will find that wonderful grace to say, my life has changed because of Christ. Thank you for this calling that's still standing today that you said the time is fulfilled. We're already living within it in 2,000 years. But you're still calling people to repent and to believe the gospel. You still call them to follow you and walk with you. And you've made it a lot easier for us also that we can have the Holy Spirit that can help us, can lead us, can guide us, can teach us and declare the full truth um, to us. Thank you, Lord, that I can just... Pray for this congregation, for their work going forward, for their leadership, that you will be with them, guide them, Lord, bless them as well, and that they will be a congregation that will have an impact in Bloemfontein as we also then move among different communities and contexts. We thank you as we ask this and we pray it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.